going to have a conversation and they're going to listen to us in our conversation. Or how do we, is that good or do you want to direct, do you want to directly talk to them? Lead away, my friend. I'm good. Firm decision. <laughs> well, why, don't, why don't we just start with introducing ourselves yeah. first? Yeah, sounds okay. good. Then when we come I'm back, flexible. then I'll come back and I'll talk a little bit about the. Don't even start that conversation. That'll just go in a whole totally different direction. We don't want. We don't want to be talking about the activities, the activities of the two spirit, because we're all initial bay too. That's right. Yeah. I know from different regions. Yeah. Right. When I first came down, I was surrounded by like 10 Mohawk women. And like, <laughs> no, so when I saw my first niche person, I was like, I'm not alone. I know. And that's exactly. usually the case. Yeah. It's usually the case. Are you guys, are we ready? Oh, yeah, sure. Okay. <laughs> Maybe you've already started. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, hello, all our friends on Zoom joining us tonight, and hello everyone who's uh, made the trek through the uh, almost insufferable heat and humidity to come to the cool uh, Fisher lounges in the Art Gallery of Hamilton. Um, just to let you know, tonight's conversation will uh, venture into some uh, um, uh, uh, intense uh, topics. It might be triggering for you. If anyone online uh, needs assistance, please let us know in the chat and we'll do uh, everything that we can to get uh, you connected with someone who can help you. And the same goes for people who are with us here physically. Um, just, uh, I'm, I'm here, I'll just be in the back. You see Denise on the camera. We have select AGH staff infiltrating the audience here, including Shauna, Jordan, and Toby. Um, so yeah, you can't escape AGH staff people. We, we're, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, it gives me such great pleasure to do this event. Uh, I'm so happy that uh, Speakers of Truth has become now a regular feature of uh, the gallery's public program. Um, we have uh, been doing these every second month uh, since September, and uh, they just keep getting better and better. Um, before I welcome our panel, let me just take a moment to acknowledge that we are here. Uh, those of us uh, who are here in this building are on the traditional territories of the Erie, the Neutral, the Huron-Wendat, um, the, the Haudenosaunee, and the Anishinaabeg. Um, the, it is land that is uh, governed by agreements such as the Dish with One Spoon Wampum that was made between the Haudenosaunee and the Anish Anishinaabeg nations. Uh, it is also governed by uh, agreements such as the 1792 uh, between the lakes uh, purchase between the Crown and the Mississauga of the Credit First Nation. Um, land acknowledgement is now a regular part of how the gallery uh, delivers a public program. It is just the very, very, very easy tip of the iceberg of reconciliation work. Um, and uh, for an institution like this, that it's based on uh, really colonial principles, colonialism infiltrates our permanent collection, it shapes the walls here, and it, even though we passionately believe that this is still a space that has a capacity to uh, uh, bring a conversation here um, where uh, uh, our indigenous uh, partners can feel safe, can have a conversation and speak truth, that it's, a, that it's a reverent space that we can listen to that truth and absorb it and continue our learning. Um, that's the mission of this, of this gallery. And that's, that's uh, it, it affects us every day. There's so much more that we need to do, but uh, a land acknowledgement is, is at least a way for us to remind ourselves of the work that we have ahead. To, uh, to edu educate ourselves about all of the issues that are hot uh, uh, for this nation and around the world, murdered and missing indigenous women, girls, trans and two-spirited, um, the, 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 the bloody history of residential schools, its victims and survivors, uh, and a raft of, of unsettled uh, land claims that are still active, that it is our obligation as allies to to learn them, to listen to uh, all the teachings that, that uh, 
that befall us and uh, to act with integrity. So um, there's your land acknowledgement. Um, the, uh, I'm thrilled to have uh, Natasha, uh, sorry, Nawalka Gishi Mikwan. Can you change my name to I Natasha? Know. <laughs> it's, it's, it's. <laughs> um, Nawalka Gishi Mikwan, Tristan, and Laura Kuchi uh, here tonight. Um, they are, uh, this is our Pride edition. This is our uh, National Indigenous History Month edition. Um, so it's a big, beautiful honor to have the three of you here. And uh, thank you for joining us for Speakers of Truth. Bonjour, Anishna, Natasha, Dijnakaj. <laughs> Natasha really is not my real name. Nawakagishi Miguan is my name. I come from the Chippewa, Zaketo, and Stony Point First Nation. I am Anishinaabe Ojokwe, a member of the Anishinaabe community uh, in southwestern Ontario. I am a first-generation residential school survivor. My mother is the survivor. I am a federal Indian day school survivor. I am auntie-uncle of 118 nieces and nephews with two more on the way. And uh, I'm very pleased and very honored to be here to Miigwech tour and everybody for being here. Boy, I am nervous to follow that up. Uh, my name is Tristan McLaurin. Uh, I'm an Anishinaabe from up north by Fort William Way. Uh, uh, I'm Bear Clan and semi-recently new to Hamilton. I've been here for about five years now uh, and I'm excited to be here. Ani. Uh... Ozawashkozi and Nankwe and Dishnikaz, Nipissing and Dunjaba, Memeskunisi and Dodem, Sego, Laura. My name is Laura. And uh, I've lived in Hamilton since I was 12. Um, my dad's side of the family is from Nipissing First Nation. And I'm Red Tail Hawk Clan. And yeah, I'm super excited for our conversation today. We really haven't any set plan where our conversations will lead us, but uh, in a previous meeting that uh, my relatives and I have had, we had determined that there's so much to cover in terms of being two-spirited, in terms of being an Indigenous queer, and that we were going to just let our conversations uh, flow where they have to go because each of us represent a different generation. Each of us represent a different path, a different road. And each of us represent a different, uh, a different part of being two-spirited along this big spectrum of uh, gender, gender identity that's known from uh, the indigenous communities. But we also, we also had agreed that it's important that it, in order for us to have our conversations that people needed to have a little bit of history about who we are and what two-spirit means. First, two-spirit is a coined term, an umbrella term, that represents all the many various phrases or terms in indigenous languages that, that represent indigenous queer people. And that each of us would probably have a different term that helps identify who we are as indigenous queer within our communities. And that indigenous queer two-spirit people have always been a part of the tradition of indigenous communities. And that indigenous queer people had very special roles and responsibilities within our communities. And that there had been heavy influence that had happened throughout uh, colonization, throughout assimilation, and throughout acts of genocide that had threatened who we are and our existence as two-spirit people. I think probably one of the easiest things to remind ourselves is that when settlers, when foreigners, when explorers first came over here to our territories, they only brought two genders with them, and that was male and female. And in our communities, many of our communities had anywhere from 15 to 17 different genders within our communities that were recognized in our communities. And that those who identified as two-spirit had very specific roles, special roles, and were honored and respected within our communities. So each of us represent on some, uh, on, along our journeys, we've had different experiences. And I think that collectively, each of us have 
there has been some difficulty, not with just mainstream community, but also within our own indigenous communities, because we must remember that through the process of genocide, through the process of colonization, that uh, many indigenous people were heavily influenced from foreign beliefs, values, uh, standards, and constructs. Indigenous communities, we had very many different constructs. We had our own systems of governance. We had that included everybody in the in community, not just those who were elected. In fact, we didn't have that electoral process that we're seeing happen in municipalities and in provinces and uh, across Canada. We didn't have those kind of systems. Those systems that uh, the heads of uh, the provinces and that the federal government have were exclusively uh, giving one person such power, whereas within our governance system, everybody carried power, everybody had a voice in our community, and quite often the two-spirit people held some of those very important roles and had some of those very important responsibilities in our communities. That, uh, and that, that's not the only kind of construct that was different. What was dramatically different from foreigners and settlers and explorers was our construct of family. Our construct of family was so different that your uh, cousins, those are our siblings, and, and with those cousins being our siblings, they carried the same roles and responsibilities that, the, um, that our, our biologically born siblings would have. Your aunties and uncles are our moms and dads, so we had many moms and many dads, and they carried all those same responsibilities that our biological parents carried. And so our, con our constructs and our legal principles and governance, uh, justice system, as well as family constructs, it only makes sense then that of course our construct of gender and gender identity was very different and how we respond to gender and gender identity was very different as well. And I can keep going on and on and on, but I, I do want to afford an opportunity. To, so that's just some of the history of who we are as two-spirited people, our, uh, to kind of lay a floor plan, a blueprint of how we're going to move forward. You have to have an open mind and an open heart to understand that these constructs for us indigenous as people were radically different than, than mainstream are uh, for settlers here. I guess they're looking at me like I have to keep on talking. <laughs> it's weird with the microphone thing. <laughs> um, yeah, and like I, I feel like I want to just like add to what you're saying about our roles and responsibilities within our communities, and I think it's really important that. Um, we talk about what some of those roles and responsibilities could have looked like and how they can translate to now. Mm -hmm. um, and so one of the ways that I've actually been able to embody um, a two-spirit role and responsibility is by learning um, indigenous language. And so learning my language of my community, Anishinaabe um, but also um, becoming multilingual across multiple indigenous languages. So I'm also learning um, Ganya Gahaga, so um, which makes sense on so many levels because I've lived in this region my whole life, um, basically raised by Six Nations aunties and uncles. <laughs> so you know it makes sense that I that I learn the language that's here too, and so um, as a two spirit person, it would have been a responsibility of mine as a diplomat to go to different communities and negotiate and be a messenger those kinds of things were important and that would have been my role. So for me, picking up these languages is fulfilling a role as a two-spirit person. And so, yeah, that's just like one thing that I'm doing. Yeah. Um, I, I can kind of, when I think about when I knew two-spirit was a term that uh, fit kind of comfortably on me, uh, was upon hearing the, these traditional roles and the ways that fit. Um, because I always kind of like the term two-spirit, at least as I came to the South, um, because at the time it was, oh, queer Indian. And it's like, okay, yeah, I, I guess that makes sense. Um, but it wasn't until I heard these descriptions as, as kind of these healers and these emotional caretakers and this middle ground that would bring people together 
And that's kind of something I've been doing through my whole life. I've, I've worn a lot of hats. I originally studied to be a nurse, and, and I did that for a while, and then I became a social worker. Uh, and now I'm kind of studying to combine those things and, and work traditional medicines into those things. And I've always been drawn to this idea of, of emotional healing and, and placing kind of the, the human at the beginning of healing as opposed to uh, a biomedical model of, of health uh, as an absence of disease. And so as these things kind of came together for me, that's when everything kind of clicked and the term two-spirit uh, suddenly became a much more close-fitting garment, and I, I felt very comfortable with it. Uh, even is, as it's uh, an umbrella term, it, it gives me that kind of space uh, to be a little bit gender fluid and to be a little bit connected to other uh, indigenous queers as they see it fitting themselves, uh, which was uh, wonderful and comforting. And, it, and, and I love hearing the stories of how w the things that we're doing in 2022 are married well with our traditional roles and responsibilities. So as the Indigenous Justice Coordinator at the Hamilton Community Legal Clinic, I'm advocating and being the voice for uh, many Indigenous people who do not, uh, who have not found their voice or who do not, have not been afforded an ability to use their voice or are afraid because of systems of oppression, racism and discrimination to, to use their voice. So a lot of what I do professionally also also provides me an opportunity to live out and fulfill those roles and responsibilities that we have as two-spirit people. So very much like my relatives here, um, the things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis are part of the roles and responsibilities. We are part of our roles and responsibilities are that we would bring people together. We bring families together, communities together that we are messengers, that we would historically in our communities run from community to community and warn individuals of perhaps any danger that was coming to the community. And, and historically, we, need, we know that one of the best known, well-known uh, two-spirit people by an uh, indigenous person by the name of Wiwa, who comes from the Zuni tribe down in one of our southern uh, indigenous communities, that was very much their responsibility that, that Laura has also um, fulfilling is languages. Wiwa was well known for uh, knowing many languages, not just the languages of the foreigners, which uh, she picked up very quickly, but also the uh, various indigenous languages so she could communicate with the, with the settlers, with the explorers, with the newcomers to the territory but also uh, having known all the indigenous languages of the many different indigenous communities, Wiwa was very famous running and telling of danger, and it was Wiwa who started running from community to community um, in actually a warning of danger that was hum coming towards the two-spirit people, but also indigenous women. Because at the same time that settlers and foreigners were attacking the existence of two-spirit people, they were also attacking the presence and the respected uh, spaces and places that indigenous women held within our communities. So Wiwa was fulfilling those responsibilities and it's so beautiful to hear that my relatives here are doing the same thing. And so I grew up in my reserve on Kettle and Stony Point. I'm family member to Dudley George of the Upper Wash Crisis. And over my time period, I've seen a lot of crazy stuff that has happened. I grew up fighting for indigenous sovereignty, for indigenous rights, uh, creating space for indigenous people within our own territories, but then also enforcing and reclaiming our space within indigenous people trying to reclaim their space for two-spirit people. And that's a really heavy chore to do, that we're not just fighting the colonization and, and all the forced racism and discrimination, like the British North American Act and the Indian Act on indigenous people, but we're also, so we're not only fighting foreign systems of governance and foreign standards and values, but we're also continually fighting the heavy influence that uh, foreigners have had on our own people and fighting this crazy heavy shroud of homophobia within our community. And many of those systems of homophobia come from things like Canadian Indian residential schools where they brought in foreign Christian and organized religious values that spoke heavily against 
uh, our existence as two-spirit people. So it threatened us. So uh, each of us in our own way, in our own time, have had to do this constant fighting to uh, reclaim our space. Yeah. Yeah, like for me, uh, there's not a straight or monogamous bone in my body. <laughs> um, and, you know, I've tried. I gave it a good try. I really did. But, I, yeah, I, I really had to work hard to, to get to a place where I'm like, okay, this is who I am, and it's all right. And, in fact, um, I am supposed to be celebrated for who I am and that my community, um, that there's a place for me in my community for who I am. And, you know, my... Um, my very first serious boyfriend back when I was in high school, I basically told him, look, you know, this is who I am. Uh, if you're not cool with it, you don't have to do this with me. And so that was when I was 15, I already knew. Um, and I was boundaried about that. And I tried <laughs> very hard throughout my life to, you know, honor that about myself. And you know, faced, it was hard, it was really hard, because I wasn't always successful, I kind of always just kind of fell in line with, like, you know, what the script of, you know, being a woman is supposed to be about, you get married to a man and you have kids, and it was very hard for me to, like, imagine a life outside of that, and so it took me a long time to figure out um, that it's okay, I can actually... I actually can have my kid and be who I am. And it wasn't until I was in my late 30s that I actually f came out fully to my family and my community. And, um, you know, it was hard growing up in the 90s. We didn't have language. Like, the most language that we had at that time, the fact that, I, that bisexual was around, that was a word. So that was the word that I used um, because there really wasn't anything else. Two-spirit... I hadn't heard of it yet. Um, it was probably just, it was fresh at that time. I think Two-Spirit just came out in the early 90s. So it was, yeah, around the same time. So I, it, it hadn't gotten to me yet. <laughs> it's not like I got the Two-Spirit memo one day and just went, oh, that's what it is. Yeah. Um, <laughs> like I actually didn't hear about it until like, pff, I don't even know when. I can't tell you when I actually heard the term Two-Spirit for the first time was. I really don't know. But when I did hear it, I was like, oh, okay, cool. Then we're going to go with that. <laughs> so that just felt right to me. But yeah. Um, so it took me a long time to finally get to a place where I could um, live openly. Um, prior to that, um, I was only open to my select friends, you know, the ones that were on a need-to-know basis, my closest buddies and um, and my sister and my mom knew. But I couldn't, I couldn't bring myself to tell anybody else. Um, but yeah, once I did come out, I was really, uh, yeah, I get really emotional because I, I, I really was accepted for who I was and I'm lucky because I know that that's not how it is for everyone. And I feel really lucky and blessed that I have such a good family and a good surrounding um, of friends that, were, that love me. And um, I was, it was relieved. It was a relieved feeling. And um, I only wish I could share all of that and give it away <laughs> so that I wasn't the only one. <laughs> because it's just, that's the way it should be. And um, I don't know what I did to deserve that, but um, just existing is, is okay. And, um, and I feel really happy that my son knows that that's also okay, you know? And um, I think, I think too, with um, having a later start in official open queer dating, that was also a trip. <laughs> like, the dating pool when you're older is already bad enough. <laughs> but when, uh, yeah. Well, you mean like, hey, do you PMP? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. So, so yeah. Um, it just uh, it just has been has been quite a trip, and I've enjoyed 
amazing relationships with um, gender diverse people and um, I'm just glad and I'm lucky that I managed to figure it out and be able to live openly and, uh, and be an example for my kid more than anything. And, it, and it's so beautiful how far we've come, it, but it, we still have so much more work to do. Mm -hmm. But how far that we've come that in your time, you were able to talk to your partner at that time about being two-spirit. But in my time, mm -hmm. coming from a Indigenous Anishinaabe community that was heavily influenced with mm -hmm. religion, where we had four or five churches in a community of 500 people, and then the occasional roll-up summer camp churches that every indigenous community had the evangelists come in with their tents and they come and plop down and want 10% of your monthly earnings and then they take off for the winter and come back the next year kind of camp meetings. But in my community, when I grew up in high school, absolutely not. You are not queer. There are no queer in my community. And so you couldn't talk to anybody safely about that. So. I lit, when I was in high school, I had all the pretty girlfriends at high school. And people talked, why wasn't Lyndon sexually active with the pretty girls that he was dating with? And it's because I was trying desperately to hide who I was. And all of that influence came from the church. Because my mom went to residential school. She had learned about the church in residential school. And she had learned that um, she had to send her kids to church, and so we had to go to church until we were 16 years of age, traveling an hour and 15 minutes from our reserve to a church over in the United States, and sit there, go, we went to church every Friday night, every Sunday morning, and every Sunday night. And you would constantly hear those messages. So I remember the first time, when you talk about two-spirit and hearing that term, I remember the first time I heard that term. And it was after being in church one afternoon. I was the fundamental born-again Christian that would walk down the street and say and stop you, do you have Jesus in your life? That's, I was that person at one point. And in my church, sitting there one afternoon in the back with my sister, who's a devout Christian, probably the best Christian that I know, because love is love for her. And, uh, but I remember that day when I was 15 years old, sitting at the back of the church, and a preacher up there started talking about how homosexuals were going to burn in hell, and that they were going to feel this everlasting pain in this place called Shale Hades. And I looked at my sister and I saw her, she was uncomfortable in her space. And then I thought to myself, what the hell am I doing in here? What am I doing in this church? And so I got up left and I went out to my sister's car and sat there so she came out. And we drove all the way back an hour and 15, 20 minutes, hour and a half back to the res. And we had no conversation. Then Friday, Sunday afternoons were the time where, uh, because you have 10 siblings, everybody's fighting for mom and dad's attention. Nobody wanted to hang out with dad in the garage Sunday afternoon, but I did. So that was my time with my dad alone to go sit out in the garage. And this day, I'm, he, my dad always said to me, got a big mouth, and on this day I was really quiet and I wasn't talking about a lot. And he said to me, what's wrong with you, Chunk? That's my nickname back home. Nobody uses real names back home, so my nickname back home is Chunk. What's wrong with you, Chunk? You're not very talkative today. And I said, eh, you know, just kind of scared. He said, something's up. So I told him, I said, the, the pastor in the church was talking about how homosexuals are going to go burn in hell and they're going to feel this pain. And my dad, real quietly, while well, he's got the hood of the truck up and he's working on the motor of the car, he had these crazy big uh, silver framed glasses and with the light blue tint. And I remember him, he's bent over doing work on his motor and he looked up at me and he said, that's not what we believe as Anishinaabe people. He said, we have two-spirit people. And that's the first time that I had ever heard of two-spirit people. But I didn't want to question my dad because I was still closeted. And I, I remember very specifically when I heard that term and how much it meant something to me, even though I didn't know quite what it was, 
but that my dad was starting to teach me about our uh, construct of gender, gender identity, really meant something to me. So I just left it at that, because uh, I didn't want them to know at that point mm -hmm. that I was identifying as two-spirit. I, I grew up in Thunder Bay, uh, and Thunder Bay has a uh, active, uh, has a very active queer community, but it's, uh, I maintain that it's a city that's about just 10 years stuck in the past. And so my experience with being queer was very wrapped up in shame. It was this very shameful thing um, where, you know, relatives would come up to me and they'd give me the like, are you gay? Like, uh, you know, it's okay, we still love you, which on its own feels terrible, right? Because your cousins aren't getting that talk. No, <laughs> if, if they're asking, it's because they think you are, right? <laughs> And so they're always saying, you know, it's okay if you are, we'll still love you. And there's that implicit message that there's something to get over in the first place. Yeah. And so they turn from, you know, it's okay if you're gay to these homophobic jokes. And, mm -hmm. you know, as soon as my hair got long, it's like, there's Tristan looking like a fag. And it's like, yeah. <laughs> nope, um, which was so stressful. Um, and so uh, with my friends, I was, I was very openly queer. Um, but when I got home or when I was around family, I remember having to, to clamp it down despite these messages that it would be, uh, it would be okay, it would be accepted, um, because it, it wasn't. Uh, you know, these, whenever a queer person was mentioned, it was stories of tragedy or failure or the ways that coming out can hurt you uh, and, and make your life hard. And there wasn't, there wasn't these queer success stories or queer people who were, who were doing well. And I remember the first time that I, I met uh, a queer couple who, was, who were successful, who had kind of been doing well with their lives, uh, was when I was about 15 or 16. Uh, I went to my local board game store with all the nerds, uh, and, and there was a very nice um, lesbian couple that were, they were very successful, they were very professional, and they were very wonderful and welcoming. Uh, and that was the space that I first felt very comfortable being queer. But I remember talking about them at some point, and hearing, I don't even remember, it was something like, oh yeah, those dykes, and it just bolted it into my head that like, all right, you cannot leave this space with that. As soon as you exit, you gotta go back to being straight. Um, and that kind of informed my relationships as, uh, you know, the queer relationships I had became very, very shameful, and they became things where I would, you know, I always had a girlfriend, and then I was always sleeping with men on the side, um, and I, I wouldn't talk about it, I'd bring it up, I wouldn't bring it up. And that brought kind of a weird dimension to it where uh, when you have to be secretive, you couldn't really do it with like guys in my high school because people would know them. And I couldn't do it with people on the reserve because they all knew my family. So I ended up running kind of from my reserve and, and kind of distancing myself from that. And that left uh, much, much older men. Um, so when I was you know, 15, I was seeing guys in like their 40s and 50s because that's who was available, right? Those are men that were also trying to keep what they were secret, uh, which was, looking back, predatory, right? Like it was one of these things where I was a very young, very queer young man kind of trying to figure out who I was and struggling with gender identity and struggling with the shame of that. And these older men, you know, some of them perhaps well-meaning and, and kind of shameful in their own right were struggling with it, but some were clearly kind of taking advantage of a person who did not know uh, what was going on. And so it, it really kind of informed my early relationship with men so that now I still have a hard time uh, trusting or, or feeling comfortable around a man that's interested in me. Uh, right away that gets my guard up and I, I instantly think, well, well, what's wrong with you? Why, why are you looking at me? What kind of brought you here? Uh, and then that immediately kind of brings me back to that, uh, that attitude of, you know, 11 years ago being a young queer kid um, in rural Thunder Bay, uh, where that just, that just wasn't okay. Uh, even as much as people would explicitly say it was, you could just see it in their eyes, the hope that like you would say no. I, that's not me, I'm not gay. Um, and it, it kind of carried with me. Uh, and so now that I've kind of, I'm coming out and I'm starting to experience this, I remember hearing, um, you know, some members of my family would sometimes say things like, oh, you know, like we, we always kind of knew or like, you know, why, why did you feel that you couldn't come out to us? And I just felt this shock uh, that they were taking this experience that was so hard for me and, and uh, it took a lot for me to come out to them and they were offended that I hadn't come out sooner. They were hurt that I hadn't decided to, to trust them with this sooner. 
Uh, and instantly I have this, this montage uh, of just homophobic jokes and, and remarks and, and things they had said about other queer community members. Um, and I just had to drop it. I just had to say like, oh, I don't know. I, I'm just uncomfortable, I guess. Uh, and even now, kind of talking about this, I can feel myself getting uh, nervous. I'm getting sweaty and I'm getting uh, panicky. Because uh, it's strange and hard to kind of come out of that, that sense of shame, uh, like I've done something wrong just in talking about it. Yeah. Uh, and that, that still sticks with me, and it's one of the things Word. that I'm still trying to get over. And it, it is tough. I know that we, we were talking about back in our communities and with Indigenous people, we're, we're still constantly fighting the colonialism and the influence of colonialism and organized religion and, and, and still the heavy shroud of homophobia that happens within our communities, whether on or off reserve, whether within our First Nations communities or not. And I know that just a, a couple years ago, Laura and I, had been confronted with that form of homophobia when we went to the annual powwow here in Hamilton. Uh, so we had been asked, Laura and I, to um, bring in and first together two-spirit people in the city of Hamilton constructed an eagle staff to represent who we were as a nation, as, as two-spirit people, and to help people understand that our lived experiences are, are even different from other indigenous people based on gender, gender identity, and, and the heavy influence of Christianity within our communities. And so together we constructed this eagle staff to represent who we are as, as in uh, two-spirit people and feeling so proud and happy taking it out on its first run in our community. Hamilton has been my home community now for uh, 10 years. I've lived here, but I've been uh, working in this area for uh, many, many years, uh, almost 30 years working in this area. And so on this day, Laura and I were going to the powwow to dance in this two-spirit eagle staff, and bam, there was the hug ugly, ugly face of homophobia standing right in front of us and denying our existence once again from our own people, from somebody from our own community telling us that this ego staff was not, was not welcome. And by telling us that the ego staff is not welcome and that it had to go to the back of the line, even though traditionally all ego staffs go first, they were denying, this individual was denying once again our existence and that's really hard. when it comes from your own community. Yeah. And at the same time, the same year, I was dealing with that same shit from my own res community. So having my new community here in Hamilton do the same thing to me that my community was doing, that was really a hard struggle. And when we weren't going to back down, that's when they tried a different tactic on, tactic on us and they used language shaming on us. <laughs> So the arena director at the powwow then told us that if they were not even, they were not even gonna talk to us any longer if we didn't speak with, to them in the language. And at that point in time, neither Laura and I were fluent in the language, so we were stuck. Finally, somebody walking by, Micah Burning, um, from Six Nations heard what was going on and she jumped in <laughs> in front of the director and she said, there's gonna be no name shaming here that's gonna happen. And so then the conversation took place between Micah Burnin and this arena director. Luckily, at the same time, Laura's father, who's a language keeper, was walking by and was curious about what was going on and he came over and he spoke to the director in the language and addressed the director and then all of a sudden all that homo homophobia was displaced. But it's difficult when you're having to fight the effects and the impacts of colonialism on gender, gender identity, and you're fighting that ugly system, and then when you have to continue to fight it with your own people, it's just, it's really hard doing that. It feels like double duty all the time in fighting for that kind of stuff. And when we gathered and we were talking about our stories about coming up, I told them that back home, the homophobia was really bad in my community. And, um, but the same homophobes in my community that were threatening to beat me up or beat up the uh, other um, identified two-spirit people in the community 
were all the same men who were knocking on our doors at midnight and say, hey, can I have some? Can I, let's have some sex? Seriously, two of my cousins and I, I've, I have many cousins who are two-spirit, but these two relatives of mine specifically, one night around the fire, the three of us sat there talking about all the homophobes in the community. And we had identified that all of the homophobes, all of the guys in our community who were threatening uh, to be violent against us were also the same individuals in the community who were sleeping with one of us or <laughs> with some other male in the community. And that, as we got older, we realized how sad that really was that they never reached a point in their life that they could feel comfortable or safe enough to be who they are. Uh, like Laura, I had a, uh, an awesome family, very supportive family, but I didn't really know that until I came out. Uh, all that hiding in the closet kind of stuff happened because it was a, it's not safe being queer, and it wasn't safe being indigenous. And you could hide being queer, but you couldn't hide being indigenous. And so there was this constant threat of violence from being indigenous and from being queer that really dictated to me, um, and I know many of my relatives too, the process of coming out. So for me, I was kind of pushed out of the closet. But there's the whole other stuff about the traditional roles and responsibilities of two-spirit people too. That was always in the back of my mind since my dad talked about two-spirit people. But the first step to understanding my roles and responsibilities was actually coming out of the closet. And finally, one day, I had a partner in, I was 15 years old and like, uh, Tristan, my, when I was 15 years old, um, my first partner was 38 years old. And it was because I felt safe that he was not going to tell anybody in my community. He lived in a nearby uh, urban center. He was never gonna come down to the reserve. And he had a car that he could pick me up and I didn't have a car at 15. I ditched him when I turned 16 and I got my license and got my own car, then I could find <laughs> that I could find somebody my own age. But uh, the homophobia in the community was so heavy that it wasn't safe coming out in a community. And by the time that I had decided I got a new partner in the city of London, which was an hour and 15 minutes away, um, and brought my partner down and I had determined I was gonna come out to my parents first. So at my parents' house, I was, uh, we were, my partner and I were down visiting. My partner was helping my dad and my brother-in-law do some stuff. And I went over to visit my grandma and the phone rang and it was my dad saying, you need to come over here, we need to talk. And so I thought, okay, that's weird. They don't usually bug me when I'm over visiting my grandma. So something had to be up. So I went back over. Everybody was out of the house. I couldn't find my partner anywhere. And my mom and dad were sitting in the living room and my dad was at one chair, my mom was at another chair, and I saw on the coffee table in front of the couch, I recognized there's a letter. And I recognized the letter immediately, and it was a love letter that my partner had given to me, and it was in my suitcase. When we went down to visit my family, my partner and I, we displaced my baby sister, and my baby sister was pissed off that she had to move out of her room, so she went digging through my luggage, found this letter, and took it to my parents. And so that's how my parents had found out that I was two-spirit. They were really cool and really groovy with it, and my mom and dad sat there, and they tried to understand first that they had so much going on in their head. It made sense to my dad why I was bothered about the whole Christian thing, the two-spirit homosexual thing. That fell into place for him. But what really bothered me was when my father started to internalize it and ask questions like, is this because 
I didn't let you play hockey because my parents had five boys. I'm being, I'm the youngest boy, and I was the one who really wanted to play hockey, but all the other boys were in hockey, so they were. My dad was getting tired running around doing the hockey thing with the other boys, so they had decided to put me in piano lessons. So, I, which I'm very grateful my parents put me in music for 13 years. I studied the piano, and I can pick up any instrument like that now. So I'm very gracious, but I still wanted to play hockey. But what bothered me is they were taking shit so seriously and they were internalizing it, and they felt like it was their problem somehow. And my role back home has always been one, a traditional role of two-spirit people as the joker, as the comedian, and instantly watching my parents with their big eyes, with big tears, and it really bothered me, so I knew that I had to do, do something comical. I was uncomfortable about the whole conversation, so rather sit down on the couch, I laid down on the couch, and so when I knew I had to break this saddened kind of air that was floating around in the living room, I sat up and said, you don't have to worry. It has nothing to do with hockey. It has nothing to do with playing with piano. And then I looked at them and I smiled and I said, but you might want to rethink the Fruit Loops and Homo Milk that you gave me every morning when I was growing up. <laughs> so that kind of dropped the whole seriousness of the situation for them. I think what was really weird though, like, like you had mentioned and Laura had mentioned as well in conversation over the years that when, so I told my parents that was cool. All of my siblings said, yeah, we knew. And I remember one of my older brothers, um, but, but my, one of my older brothers just absolutely hated that I was gay. And so he was the first one to come to me and say, you're no longer welcome in my home. And for five years, I did not talk to him. I would sit right beside him at the dinner table at different feasts that we would have, and I would not acknowledge him. And uh, then one day at the fifth year, my father said, you T need to get this shit straightened out. I don't know who has to apologize to who, but it's not happening in my home again, so fix this shit up. So my brother did eventually come to me and apologize and said to me that, he was so sorry that he missed five years of my life and that's building a relationship. That's what led me to want to come out the closet with my family, as I could not stand them not knowing who I am. I could not stand that I was hiding this part of who I am, and I could not stand that I was not going to be able to, as long as I was closeted, I was not going to be able to be the two-spirit person that I wanted to be. Because my influence back home, even though there is, and I was just sharing this with, with my relatives here earlier, one of my biggest influences back home growing up, being the closeted queer that I was, there was this gentleman in my community who was teased and picked on all the time. And no matter where he was in the world, he was a very successful two-spirited man, worked for many big magazines, traveling all over the world, was very respected in the community for who he was as a professional. Zero respect for an individual who was two-spirit, but no matter where he was in the world, he always came home for powwow, and he always danced Fancy Saul, which had been traditionally in my community, um, that dance was only for women to do. But he would get up in a powwow, and he would dance that Fancy Saul. He started his spiritual journey now, and started when I was younger, but he would never know the influence that he had for young, closeted queers like me. So in my mind, that's also part of my role and responsibility in my communities, both here in Hamilton and back home on my res, is that I have to let young, closeted, indigenous, queer people see that we do exist and that we are at the powwows, and that we are contrary, and we are men who dress like women and women who dress like men because that's going to mean something for them too. I, um, to, to steal from uh, Ali Beardsley, uh, which is a, a non-binary comedian that I, I absolutely love, they said uh, one of the worst parts about being in the closet is how isolating it is, uh, and that's something that really resonated with me. Uh, and I think about those, those wonderful 
queer people who kind of helped uh, us come out of the closet. And I think about the regrets that I have in, in kind of not coming out sooner. Because when I did come out, it was a lot of people saying like, you know, we love you no matter what, this is great, this is who you are, and, that, and that's fantastic. And that's fine. My relationship with them is good. Uh, I, I recently went back um, and kind of came out to my father, which is one of the ones that was uh, a little bit uh, nerve-wracking, but uh, I had a party to go to, and I decided that I was going to go uh, queer as hell, so I might as well come out to him. Uh, and it went, it went very well, and, and I remember um, that similar thing of, of not feeling safe on community. I, I would never step foot onto my reserve dressed the way I am now and, and wearing makeup, because I don't physically feel safe. Um, and so I remember coming up to him and he said, uh, you know, hey, do you, you want to go for a drive? That's, you know, he likes to get in his truck and we, we go drive around the res and, uh, you know, maybe we go shoot some pop cans or, or we just look at the trees or, or whatever. And I remember feeling so nervous as I, I was wearing this exact skirt and I said, hey, w would it be okay if I dress like this? Uh, and he went, yeah, I don't care if you dress like, you look like a librarian. Uh, and so I just <laughs> smiled at that because uh, I felt really safe. You know, my, my dad's a, a big guy, he's, you know, six foot something, a couple hundred pounds, he's a big dude. And that was the only time that I'd feel safe being around my community dressed like this is with someone so obviously masculine um, that, that made me feel more comfortable. And I think about those kind of, uh, you know, being in the closet so isolating. And I think about the other indigenous queer people that were probably, you know, knew they were queer and just didn't know how to say it, didn't want to be exposed to that violence. And how if I had come out a little bit sooner and dressed the way I did a little bit sooner, maybe it would have been easier for them to kind of see that it was all right and that it, it didn't have to end in this queer tragedy. And so that's kind of been a big driving force uh, for me now in, in making sure that I really name myself loudly and say that I'm two-spirit and, and um, that came with a weird kind of pushback where, where people will be like, oh, but do you have to be so in our faces about it? Do, does it have to be your whole personality that you're gay? Um, and my first response is usually like, fuck off. Uh, and, uh, and really it's, it's kind of like, well, yeah, because there are little kids who are seeing, you know, that it's not okay to be gay, it's scary to be gay, it's something that you need to hide, and I don't want them to feel that way anymore. So now as an adult, I've been really um, cognizant and, and try to be really aware and, and really deliberate in how I dress and how I name myself uh, as a queer person. And I had a really positive experience coming down here at the South with, uh, I call them my work aunties, uh, but I, I've got these wonderful women that I, I've worked with as a social worker that have really kind of fostered me and, and taught me a lot of things. And I remember just kind of dropping in a con casual conversation with each of them, you know, I, I'd say like, oh, you know, I, I'm two-spirit or, you know, I use they, them pronouns or something like that. And getting just a, you know, it, it wasn't even a big thing. They just acknowledged it in a very yeah. healthy way. Um, and it was, it was wonderful. Uh, and it's something that's kind of stuck with me is this very casual acceptance that didn't have to be a big deal. Yeah. Uh, and it, it just felt so good. And it's something that's kind of really stuck with me. That's how it was too when I first came out. I had work aunties as well, as you do. <laughs> and it was the same thing. I would be like, well, I'm like two spirit. And they'd be like, so? And then moving on. <laughs> like it was like nothing. <laughs> and meanwhile, I'm like, oh God. Like, <laughs> just let me like pick my heart up off the floor and try and swallow it down again. <laughs> like, Oh my gosh, yeah, yeah, the work aunties. That support system was huge for me when I was we first coming out. We love our work out. aunties. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, but yeah, that, as you're, I really, it, it breaks my heart that the closet is still a place where young people feel like they have to stay. And I stayed in it too, too long, you know. Um, my relationships with, um, with other women were held in secret. Um, the only place that I had camaraderie was um, when I was in my early 20s. It was just the start of the internet, kind of. Like, the internet was there, but it wasn't like social media the way it is now. Um, there was like, it started out as, a, as an email list. And then it grew to an online discussion forum. And it was in that forum that I kind of really came into my own and like was like connecting with other bi women who were in straight relationships, straight appearing relationships. 
Um, and so often I would be behind the keyboard literally like mentoring a lot of these women because to me, I would know who I was for like, since I was a kid. Um, whereas a lot of these women were like just kind of coming around um, to who they were. Some of them were way older than me. Like I was in my 20s, but there were women in their 30s, 40s even, 50s, who were just trying to navigate their identity and, and their sexuality. And they were married and didn't know what to do to like talk to their husbands about it. And do they come out? Do they whatever? Like it was, it was an intense time, but it was an amazing time too because um, <laughs> we'd get together, we had parties. <laughs> And some of those parties would be like, either um, we would like rent out a venue so that we get the whole venue to ourselves and have crazy dance parties that were just amazing. Other times there were ski trips. There was no skiing. Um, other times there were like, we'd go to a, like a swingers bar and like reserve one section for us. And so those were some amazing times. And the, the, that system of women is what got me through my 20s. And I really missed it when everything kind of fell apart <laughs> at some point. I think with the, um, just the cost of operating the whole system and there was, there was some other stuff that happened, but eventually it, it disbanded. But, um, but I'm still in touch with quite a few of those women actually. And, um, and they're kind of like this sisterhood that I have that's always been there. And, it's lovely, and I think back on those times very fondly, but um, yeah, they were the ones that got me through. Um, but again, it wasn't something that I could talk about really, like they were a group of friends that I just didn't talk about with other friends. And they were a group of friends that I didn't talk about at work, and they were a group of friends that none of my family knew about, <laughs> like, um, yeah. So um, actually, like when, my, when I got pregnant with my son, these um, women threw me a bridal, a uh, bridal shower, baby shower. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot tell you some of the gifts I got. <laughs> it was a, it was the best baby shower. But uh, yeah, these these women saw me off in a great way. So, but yeah, like um, once I actually came out, um, it was just a relief to be able to have relationships in the open, transparent. You know not hidden away, not, you know, under this cloak of shame or secrecy or, um, I mean, even still, I mean, the complexities of having a same-sex relationship in public is, is like a whole other thing. So there's never really safety truly, but um, it was just nice to not have to hide, you know. And I think that's one of the more frustrating things for me that you know, along my journey is that realizing after we learn our way of life and our way of being that all of this other hardship and bullshit that I'm talking about and that my relatives had experienced, we should have never had to have experienced that within our territories uh, because we didn't have all this garbage in our community. So I think that's part of the struggle for me and the frustrating uh, stuff for me comes from having to constantly see our young people who are still, you know, even though it is a little bit easier for our younger relatives, it's still a very complicated process coming out because of the heavy influence and, and the stuff that we're talking about, the hardships of being two-spirit or indigenous queer, these are the impacts of colonization on indigenous communities. This is our reality. I remember one of my older brothers saying to me, yeah, we all knew that you were gay when you were a kid. When you were a kid, you were this little guy who wanted to do all the little boy stuff, but you wanted to do all the little girl stuff too. So you wanted to run around the neighborhood with your pellet gun and shoot everybody with a pellet gun, but you also wanted all the Barbie dolls too. And so they knew at a very young age, and at that very young age, when our families would have seen these roles that we were all that were already manifesting themselves the masculine and the feminine uh, um, manifesting through us 
That's the time when our, com our families and our communities would have gathered, and that's when they would have started to teach us the masculine and the feminine. All of those yeah. ceremonies, all of those things that we should have learned at that, at that right early age. Gate. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Like, I feel lucky that I got to, like, I, I was very fasted when I got my first period, and my aunties took care of me in that traditional way. I'm, I'm the first woman in several generations to have that. At the same time, though, there were times where, like according to our teachings, that we have to sit back at times when we're on our moon cycle and we stay away from the medicines and stay away from ceremonies. There were times where I just didn't feel that that was right for me. And I still don't know what to do about those things, you know? There were times where I was like, I you know, a, a powwows too. Like I wasn't supposed to dance when I'm on my moon. And I was like, but I, but I need to. Like there's a part of me that needs this healing. There's a part of me that needs to access this medicine. And I'm not less, I'm not. We're powerful and we're not gonna cancel out those medicines. Yeah. We're not going to do damage to your ceremony. Yeah. That energy is special. That's sacred. Why did I have to sit there and abstain from the medicine that I needed at that time? And, you know, what can we do? What can we do to make it better for the youth that are afraid to come home, you know? And I, I think I think what you, what you've hit upon again is how our constructs and our way of life and way of being is so dramatically different. Like yeah. uh, I know my mom talked about um, just briefly because my mom wouldn't talk much about uh, Indig Anishinaabe way of life after having been influenced from residential school. And much of that knowledge she had pushed back into uh, way back in her mind because she affiliated our way of life then as something being dangerous. So she didn't engage much in it, but she still remembered. But our the, the differences between the moon cycle, the moon time, the menstruation, the period time for women from indigenous communities to non-indigenous communities, it's so way different. Like it was a time of, it's like festival and party, extravaganza, let's have a good time, everybody come and feast and party that a young, a young girl is now starting a new journey. Let's, let's talk about that and, and let's not hide it. It's, there's nothing to be ashamed of. So that whole system of shame for many different things, um, including the menstrual cycle, is not, is not ours. We didn't have that kind of shame. I remember one day when I was in a meeting at the office here at the uh, legal clinic, we're sitting in a staff meeting and I'm looking at my phone and I could see it's my niece calling me. And so I just let it go to voicemail, and, but she kept calling. So I thought, oh no, when you have a big family that, and somebody's calling you, you know something big's going on if they're persistent. So I excused myself from the meeting and went and took her call thinking the worst. But my niece was excited. I was the second person she called to say, uncle, I started my period. And now we have to have ceremony. That's how our community celebrate. And so when we're, I think part of my frustration is that we're constantly fighting to regain and reclaim our space as two-spirit people, which makes us really significantly different than other members under what I call the gay acronym, the LGBTQ, GPNIC, um, or the queer alphabet, I call it. The Rainbow it, Mafia. What is it? The Rainbow Mafia. That's it, the Rainbow <laughs> Mafia. Is that, and in, in why we're seeing uh, right across Turtle Island that two-spirit people are asking that respectfully that we remain separate for several different reasons. And one of the biggest reasons for me is that our identities as two-spirit people has nothing in our communities, has nothing to do with who we have sex with. 
It's about our roles and responsibilities in the community and those things that we are, we have to innately bring back into the community and share with the community. That makes us significantly different. Plus the fact that we're the only group in Canada that yet still uh, governed by the most racist and discriminatory piece of legislation known as the Indian Act. And uh, for many, many other reasons. But it, I, it, that's a, always been a frustrating thing for me is that at that young age when my brother said you were different, Chunk, that's when the community and family should have nurtured that two-spirit being and that, but it's that impact of colonialization, it's the impact of various organized religions that stop these things from happening in our community. Our communities had ceremonies for the two-spirit people as well. That's why I have my basket and bow here is because the basket and bow was one of those ceremonies that we would have in our many indigenous communities. So you would have this big uh, dried shrub fence with an eastern and a western door and a basket and a bow would be placed in there. And the young children whom community uh, would suspect to be two-spirit would go out there and it had been assumed that if you were a male and you picked up the basket that you were two-spirit and that if you were female and you picked up the bowl you would pick uh, you would be two-spirit I like to think that had our community my community been functioning this um, ancient ceremony that I would have picked up and I would have went in and picked them up both of them yep. because I, what I was thinking I would I would I want, want them all oh I want this yeah I, that that's what I would have done picked them both up <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I, when I, whenever I think of ceremony, I, I, I've always felt at the edge of a lot of things. I, and, and when I, shame is a, a really big word in my life. And, and there was a lot of shame around being indigenous, um, which wasn't always marketed as shame. Uh, you know, I was very proudly indigenous and I, I'd say it openly, uh, especially because I didn't always feel indigenous. I, I have a white mother uh, and so I have a big white family on that side. And I definitely remember hearing comments like, oh, you're not even that Indian, or like, don't talk that way, you sound uneducated. Uh, and, and these little things that still kind of come to my mind and, and still make it really hard. And I know when I, when I hear someone say something like, oh, you're too white to be Indian to, to one of my friends, it just, this rage boils up inside me of like, oh my God, I can't stand hearing those things. And, it, and so it's one of these many things that uh, makes me feel like I'm at the edge of these communities that I'm always just kind of sitting there looking in at people who can participate in ceremony and people with these beautiful regalias. And, and for me, drum circles have always been the hardest. It's something I've always been attracted to the drum. I've always loved drum. I've always looked with envy uh, upon people that are invited to those drum circles. And as I grew up, uh, I didn't have a lot of chances to engage in those ceremony as much as I kind of hungered desperately for them. And, and as I became an adult, they, I still kind of sat at the edges because they were men's drum circles or they were women's hand drum circles and I didn't feel comfortable. It felt like I was invading those spaces. Um, and, and so I, I had a bit of a, a not great experience with a community member who, who had said some disparaging things about especially young two-spirit folk and, and how they didn't know who, that, who they were or what that meant or, or anything like that. And it, and it left me kind of rattled and uh, I, I was kind of walking away and, and this other community member must have seen my face because uh, he just scooped, he put an arm right around my shoulder, he pulled me in, and he says, don't listen to that. When you come to our drum circle, it doesn't matter who you are. And he plopped me down in a drum circle that was him and a couple of elders and the, these kind of big men that, you know, I've always been kind of felt uncomfortable around. And they didn't care. They, it didn't matter that I was two-spirit. One came by and he took a little feather and he stuck it in my hat and they, they taught me to drum and, and we sang together. Uh, and it was, it was just incredible. And it's one of those things that, uh, like I said, with Two-Spirit kind of clicked into place with me, is those people in the middle. Because I've always felt like I've been in the middle of a bunch of things, so whether that's being uh, indigenous and non-indigenous, whether that's kind of being queer but, but keeping it hidden, whether that's being between these different families, is I've always kind of felt like a, a middle person, just kind of sitting there in between all these things, but not really belonging to any of them. Uh, and so that two-spirit umbrella of someone being between communities but bringing them together uh, seemed uh, optimistic. It seemed really hopeful of like, oh, that's how I can make this work. I don't have to feel like I don't belong to either. I can instead say I belong to both and I'm gonna make that work. 
Uh, and that's something that I've been really chasing for. I've been trying to replace that, that theme of shame that has kind of chased me through my life uh, with a theme of, of optimism, of bringing things together. Uh, and it's felt really nice uh, embracing that. I have a Nishnabe Mawin word for you, and I'll tell, you, tell it to you later. <laughs> Yo. Um, yeah, I, that feeling of in-betweenness is the word um, that it, it, that's what it means, basically. And it was, it was a word that I learned through somebody else, but I'll give it to you in private later. <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, that, that feeling of uh, being on the edge and being in between worlds that has definitely been my experience because being a white passing person, being a straight passing person, neither, you know, the biphobia that exists in the queer community and, you know, homophobia that exists everywhere else. <laughs> it's like, okay, <laughs> great. <laughs> um, and yeah, I'm, I'm the person that everybody says the things, the racist things, the homophobic things, I've heard them all because they think I'm, a, I'm white or they think I'm straight. And so I hear all of the things. And so, um, yeah, just And I feel like those people brutal. then come <laughs> like, to you afterwards and say things like, oh, but I would, I would never feel that way. I would never say those things. And it's like, <laughs> of course you don't remember it. It was just a Tuesday to you, but that <laughs> right. stuck with me. Yeah. I remember watching those words come out of your mouth. Yep. <laughs> and now you're coming to me and saying that it doesn't matter. You know, yeah. it's all love. It's like, really? Is it though? Because what are you going to go and say to those people that you now feel I'm not a part of anymore mm -hmm. when you feel safe in those little circles when you're alone? Yeah. And, and what do you say to your friends that you think aren't queer but maybe are just still in the closet and you're saying these things to and driving them deeper? Mm -hmm. uh, and it's something yeah, or, you're, or you're knocking at our door at right? midnight. Yeah, exactly. And, mm -hmm. and what's frustrating as well when we're fighting these big systems and particularly our own people is that we know historically that two-spirit people have held these very significant roles and that it had always been believed and uh, to Murray Sinclair, Senator Murray Sinclair summed it very clearly when he said that indigenous communities have always believed that when two-spirit people conduct ceremonies or even when two-spirit people are in ceremonies that those ceremonies are much more spiritual than they have ever been. And a very recent uh, Madewin, uh, which is a Anishinaabe group, Madewin elder, had said that two-spirit people don't even realize how spiritually powerful they are. And that's because we're just, in the last 10 to 15 years, we're picking up our bundles, we're gathering our wisdom and our knowledge, and we're reclaiming our spaces within our communities because we know the impact that colonization, we know the impact that racism, discrimination, we know the impact that sexism has had within our communities. And we can't sit back quietly and wait for our knight in shining armor to come because he's not coming. Nobody's coming, so we have to do it ourselves. And so we have to initiate these uncomfortable conversations. We have to challenge our own elders and spiritual keepers and our knowledge keepers and uh, everybody else and remind them that we're a part of this history too and that we come from ancient societies where we don't get to pick and choose what is part of our community and what is not. I remember back home in my community years ago that um, there was, a, so one of the most spiritual of all ceremonies for the Anishinaabe people is what's called the shake and tent ceremony. And I remember the shaken tent ceremony coming back to southwestern Ontario after many, many years. And the communities in southwestern Ontario haven't been so heavily influenced by Christianity that when the shaken tent ceremony came back into our communities, immediately this most sacred ceremony became a form of witchcraft. And that nobody should ever go to the shake and tent ceremony because it's witchcraft. Well, shit, I've been hearing that stuff my, own, my entire life in our community. My parents were witches because they used to run the powwow back home in my community. So I come from this long line of witches, I guess, because I, I keep on doing the work and enforcing the work. But that's the kind of crap that we're faced with in our communities. Those are the kind of belief systems that are still somewhat exist in our community. This year though, we're seeing a change. And we're seeing a change because 
people like myself and my relatives here are standing up and saying, we're not taking your homophobia bullshit anymore. And you're going to honor us in our spaces because we're not moving. So we're demanding things like that there be honor songs for two-spirit people in our ceremonies and at our powwows and welcome two-spirit people back so that we don't ever have to feel shame or alienation from our communities and so that we're fulfilling our roles and responsibilities by coming back into the circles, reclaiming our spaces so that our ceremonies are once again as spiritual as they need to be and should be. Do we want to take a second and talk about our, our upcoming powwow? I don't think we've mentioned it yet. Absolutely, do it, yes. Uh, so we've got an upcoming powwow over up at Battlefield Park uh, on June 24th, 25th, and 26th. 24th, there's going to be an educational conference, um, which is, you have to buy tickets for that, but it's going to be a bunch of speakers and elders uh, speaking about things like this. Uh, less of a queer bent to it, but still very kind of important things uh, and conversations about traditional roles and, and also being a modern Indigenous person. Uh, and then on the 25th and 26th is the actual powwow itself, uh, where there's going to be a, an honor staff, and, and uh, we're going to be right up the front there. Um, so you'll see us up out there bringing the staff and, and dancing, and there'll be all sorts of other stuff going on. Uh, so. Don't forget about that. And this is, this is very this is historical for Hamilton Powell because what I had just talked about that my relative Laura and I had gone through at the powwow. And so now they're going to uh, welcome us back into the circle. They're going to do an honor song for two spirit people. This stuff, although it's important for me and I know it's important for the relatives, it's going to be so important for the hundreds of little indigenous kids who are there and are going to see this happen. So that they can be like me when I was that little kid who watched that guy do the fancy shawl at the powwow and they'll come back and they'll be able to. The other thing that's really exciting about our pow, the three of us were just acting, I get so excited at talking about this, but the three of us were at the first two-spirit powwow in Toronto that they had a couple weeks ago and it was amazing. It was so amazing because it was 2,000 plus indigenous queer people and our allies at this powwow where we didn't see any of the homophobia, where we didn't have to experience any of the shame, and where if you were a man who dressed like a woman or a woman dressed like a man or dressed however the hell you want to be, that was okay. And if you wanted to dance backwards, it was okay. I think the most beautiful part of the whole day were the opening words, and I know that Laura had talked about some protocols at the beginning, and I think part of the most beautiful part was the opening to this powwow where they talked about we have many different nations at this powwow and everybody's coming with their own protocols. Take this opportunity to meet people, to greet people, learn their protocols and exchange protocols but do not force them on anybody else because that's not welcome here. And that's what needs to happen at our spaces is that everybody has their own protocols, their own way of doing things. Uh, for instance, I know Anishinaabe people, we go clockwise sometimes. Haudenosaunee people go counterclockwise. That's okay. Just leave us alone to do what we need to do so that uh, we're doing our own ceremonies. Isaac Murdoch said one of the most important things that has had such an influence on me over the years, Isaac Murdoch said, indigenous people, we often forget that even when we're just on the land or by the water, we're in ceremony. And we need to acknowledge that relationship that's happening spiritually. But for having run into my relatives here and every other queer indigenous person all over North America, because they came from all over, because it's not, it wasn't common to have these two spirit specific spaces and that we could really just be who we are. I've been staring longingly at the San Francisco two spirit powwow going, <laughs> one oh, we're day definitely I'll get going. there, one day February, I'll get there. February but, next oh, year, I'm totally God. going. Yeah, well, I might just join you. <laughs> but that, it's been on my bucket list for one. a long time. Yeah. But yeah, so to finally have it here, like that was incredible. Oh, like so beautiful. I grew up as, like when I was a teenager, I was a powwow dancer. I danced fancy shawl and jingle. And like there were times where I'd look at those grass dance outfits and go, I wonder, <laughs> you know, just I like the wheels grass. were turning. <laughs> wheels were super turning and like, but you know, that was just like the unthinkable, right? So um, it was just amazing to be able to see um, each, 
you know, dance being done however and not done by the binary of gender. And oh my gosh, and like the women's drum singing. Oh, okay, so, so when I saw those men's, tra men's traditional dancers dancing to the women's drum, t like tears flew out of my face. <laughs> like that was just, it was, it was incredible. It was so healing to see what's possible when all of those false binaries are just gone because that's not, that's not who we are. No, absolutely. And, and to clarify that, um, because of misogyny and because of the influence of colonialism and uh, the roles and responsibilities of, and the uh, roles of respect and honor of women and two-spirit people in our communities, there became this myth that women should not ever be at a big drum. And so at this powwow, the lead drum, the home drum, was indigenous women on the big drum. And it was just so, the energy was absolutely beautiful. I just, I'm still living in, in, in just surviving from the energy of that powwow and now looking forward to everything else that's happening because now we're seeing two-spirit powwows and gatherings happening all over the place. There's one happening, I think, this weekend, no, the same weekend as a powwow here, there's a two-spirit ha uh, powwow happening in Chuchiging, yeah, I think it's, it's really, called. It's way up there, right? Eh? Yeah, way up north, which I never it's thought incredible. would be happening in our communities in the north. Yeah. And, and we're seeing things like historical things like what's happening in, in Hamilton. And it's because we've, we're, we're coming back and reclaiming our space and we're reminding our communities that we're still here. But this is the constant fight that we're having against um, colonization, uh, fighting things like constructs. Like the constructs of family, and you might think that might not be important for indigenous people, but constructs of family are so incredibly important when you look at things like policies like bereavement leave. Right, so you use somebody else's construct of family and you don't recognize my first cousin as my sibling, yeah. I get no paid time off to yeah. grieve. And, and why do you want to even ha force me to come back to work when I'm grieving? Luckily, I work in an environment where that entire system has changed so that they recognize not only that indigenous people have different constructs of family, that, but many other people who have migrated and ca call Canada home have had to build new families. And so that construct of family doesn't work for everybody. So I'm, I'm very appreciative that I work at the legal clinic and, the, and they really do understand and see that um, one family construct doesn't work for everybody. But I think what, what we're talking about is the big role that colonization has played on indigenous people and, and specifically has uh, threatened the existence of two-spirit people. And it may have been at some point in time that we, you may not have seen us, that doesn't mean that we went extinct. It just means that we were held well hidden and that our roles and responsibilities and everything else that comes with all of our bundles, our, our bundles aren't just the things that you see, but they're the teachings that we pick up along the way. All of those things were not lost, it's just we had to hide them until we reached a point like where we are today, where we f are starting to feel a little safer within our own skin. We're understanding now our roles and responsibilities in our communities. We're reclaiming them, and we're trying to make a better existence for two-spirit people and trying to change some of these constructs so that they better reflect um, who we are as Indigenous people. And so with me, um, I'm also watching the time and I really wanted to, to share with folks uh, my personal experience of having been a federal Indian day school survivor and how that construct of school and education uh, and what role it played in my life and the, the role that it played in many two-spirit people's lives day school was kind of the response to the government after residential schools, after 60s school, the government still wanted to assimilate and kill the Indian within the child. And there was all this pressure on the government and the churches about Canadian Indian residential schools, but 
They didn't want to get rid of that control. They didn't want to get rid of the hope that they were going to be able to kill the Indian in a child. So they thought that rather than taking the kids and bringing them to schools off the reserve, we'll put schools on a reserve and we'll make the kids go there. And that's what we know as Federal Indian Day School. Still run by the government, still run by the church, still only giving you a very narrow perspective. So in those schools, they only came with two genders as well. And they fostered organized religion and Christian values uh, around women not having a strong voice or having positions within the community, but also very much engaged themselves and fostered and nurtured beliefs around homophobia. So those stories about homosexuals going to burn in hell. So in my community, when I went to Federal Indian Day School, sorry, this is... I'm only apologizing for the amount of time that it might take for me to tell you this story. I'm not apologizing for what I'm feeling. So in Federal Indian Day Schools, things happened like they would send down a dentist to do dental work on Indian children, but they didn't give you anesthetic. So when they were pulling out your teeth and taking out your fillings, you felt it. And because they were run by the church, um, it was an, it was an, there was an element of homophobia that you could always feel around you. And I remember one day going to school and I was already, as my brother said, I was that different kid growing up. I wanted to do the little boy stuff, but I wanted to do the little girl stuff. And they had always hired this token Indian to work in the residential school or in the Federal Indian Day School. And the token Indian at our school was a woman who would come in and she was supposed to be teaching us a language, but we never learned much language from her. She was a very strong Christian woman in the community and very well-known Christian woman in the community. And because she was Christian, she fostered and nurtured homophobic views. So I remember one day out on a playground, sitting on one of the concrete, they had those concrete dividers that they put at the end of a parking space. I was sitting on one of those, and a lot of the kids in the school were calling me fag, calling me fairy, and teasing me. And I remember looking up and seeing the teacher, who was a representative from the church and from the government, and this tokenized Indian resource teacher looking at me as the kids were picking on me and calling me these homophobic names. And they just stood there and smiled and didn't stop those kids from doing that. Federal Indian Day School did not provide me with the safer space that I required to be a young person growing up. They did not provide any indigenous children with an opportunity to learn about our way of life, let alone for me to learn about who I am as a two-spirited Anishinaabe Ojibwe person. And because they didn't do anything, the older kids at the other school watched as these younger kids picked on me. And so that became this kind of element of normalcy that it was okay to pick on the little fags in school. And so one day, not and, and nobody was going to be punished for it. And one day, shortly after that day, some of the older boys um, took me behind the school and, well, and they raped me. And well, one of the boys had me in a headlock and was holding me bent down. The other one was violating me uh, aggressively. But I think what was more and has been more troublesome for me was in that pain and that feeling of helplessness. I looked and I saw this little Indian boy look around the corner and he saw what was happening and he ran. He didn't even try. 
And that made it really difficult for me then to identify as two spirit because that homophobia in our communities equated to pain. It would equate um, rape. It would mean that if I come out of the closet, all of these things were going to happen to me all over again. And those institutions, Canadian Indian residential schools and federal Indian day schools were responsible for providing safe space for indigenous kids and they did not do that. They were spaces that fostered and nurtured uh, horrible aspects about humanities or no humanities, rather. They were spaces that uh, disease ran rampant and it was okay to use indigenous children as test subjects as well for different diseases. And because of that, that's the impact of colonization on two-spirit people. And so when you try to come out in your community as a two-spirit person and you have this whole legacy of harm that has happened, it makes it very difficult and it makes you start to question whether or not this is a role that you want to take on and if this is the journey that you want to have and if this is the battle that you're willing to take. And it's a tough battle because we're constantly working against and struggling against our own people now. So all of those values and systems that colonizers brought to our community, our own people have absorbed at different levels. And now we're fighting our own people who have absorbed those values. And now, after all that has passed, and I am who I am now, I'm that person where I don't give a shit. I am this age, and I've made it this far, I have a voice, and I'm going to continue to use my voice, and I'm going to continue to do whatever I need to have to do to make sure that indigenous voices are heard and that two-spirit voices are heard, that indigenous people have safer space and that two-spirit people have safer space because of Gary, that fancy shawl dancer. He is the one who's always in the back of my mind because he was the only role model that I had. Even though I sat back in the audience and I heard all the horrible things that people would say about Gary, all the homophobia and the violence that was projected onto Gary, he was still a role model for me because he was doing something extremely spiritual against all the homophobia. He was the person in my community who's doing the work that we're doing in our communities now for me. And we're going to be the people in our communities that those little five-year-old kids are looking at. That's the impact that we have. And, and thank you for listening to that story. That's the, the first time that I've ever told that story out in public. And right now, uh, I've, I've struggled with that Federal Indian Day School stuff because it's one of the popular claims right now that's happening, and I've not, um, I've not engaged in the process of the class action suit because I've been busy. Part of what I've done is I've helped hundreds of other Federal Indian Day School survivors put together and participate in the class action suit, and walking on that journey with all of them has led me to this point tonight that I'm able to talk about that story of how it affected me. And, and that's really important. So thank you so much for affording me the opportunity to share that with you. That's, that was a real tough one um, because that leads right to the core of my identity as a two-spirit person. And so having to fight like all the roles and responsibilities that we have as two-spirit people, they're so beautiful, they're so wonderful. One of our roles and responsibilities, and I think this is so incredible, when people in our community, when couples were going to have children, they come to us 
and ask for us to give names to their children. Those are the kind of respected roles and responsibilities that we have. We can carry um, the masculine and feminine ceremonies. It was 20 years ago now that I was gifted a traditional Anishinaabe, a traditional indigenous woman's water ceremony was given to me by an, an elder, an indigenous uh, Anishinaabe uh, kwa woman. She gave me that ceremony. So now that's part of my responsibility to teach other people, two-spirit or um, young women or women, that ceremony. And it's so beautiful that we're able to engage all of those realities in our identity as two-spirit people. I'm going to stop talking for a no. second. No. Miigwech. Um, miigwech, Lyndon, for sharing that story with us. And I'm just with you in rage, you know? My grandfather was a survivor of residential school, so... Um, Yeah, I don't really know what else to say. Um, I just, I just feel so incredibly honored and um, lucky that I was born now, and that I could share space with both of you and do this work. You know, for those little ones growing up. You know, I keep thinking about all those little kids at the powwow when we were there. And just thinking about how much better it can be for them. It doesn't need to be so hard, you know. So thank you, Lyndon, for surviving everything and being here today because I wouldn't be here without you. You've been a huge part of my journey. And so I'm so grateful that you're here. I don't think I've told you this yet, um, but when I first came down to Hamilton, and I, I kind of floated this this trial run of being two spirit. Um, I, I told Yvonne Miracle. I talked to her, and she said, "Have you met Lyndon?" <laughs> um, and I hadn't at that point. Um, I just and I, I was working on that guide, and I was working on the, with the with that organization there. And um, she said, "Go talk to Lyndon." Uh, and so I, I found an excuse. Um, something with the legal clinic. I needed to take pictures or something. Uh, and I, I sent you an email. And I remember just feeling thrilled to know that there was this two-spirit person that was so successful. He was working with the legal clinic. Um, and it didn't have to be the story of tragedy. It was someone who was doing well. Um, and I really, I really looked up to you. And I, and I, do, I still do. Um, and uh, I don't think I ever told you that. Um, mm. And now you're hearing all my tragic <laughs> stories. <laughs> well, well, thank you. But I mean, we don't, I, I don't do this stuff alone. No, you know, there's, there's, strength, <laughs> yeah. there's strength in like that feeling that we had when we were at the Two-Spirit Powwow. This is change that we're all making together. And I, I love that there's three generations uh, that are represented here, both with all different journeys that our experiences, although we've all experienced a lot of the same stuff, um, we each experienced something different based on time, era, and space, and where we were at that time. Because um, I, I know that I, I used to run, I used to go hang out in London, Ontario all the time, because it was like an hour away, hour and 15 minutes from my reserve. But London, Ontario was an extremely racist, place and it was not a safe space to be either indigenous mainly or queer and then I found that 15 minutes on the other side of the border to Detroit wow man that's the place where I hung out because being indigenous and being queer it was safer for me to hang out in Detroit than it was in London Ontario and in Hamilton here I've not really ever felt endangered for being queer like I felt being in danger for being indigenous here. I've never really felt threatened being queer here until Pride a couple years ago that yeah. I experienced that violence at Pride there and that was crazy shit to witness and see. I'd never seen 
well, I have seen violence. I mean, I, I've stood in the face of, with the army rifles in, in my face from the Upper Wash crisis and also at Oka, but this was a whole different level of violence because there were so many people just standing around and watching it happen. And that was frightful. And, and so I think we all have those experience of trauma and those, that trauma just, I don't know, makes us stronger and makes us push forward. It shouldn't have to though. We shouldn't have to. We shouldn't have to. No. I don't remember the scholar who said it, but I, I hear it all the time now is I'm, I'm so tired of being resilient, right? Yeah, that's, right? that's quoted as being the mm -hmm. like, indigenous people are resilient. And it's, it's something that for a long time I was really proud of, of like, yeah, that's right, we're tough. It doesn't matter what you throw at us, we're fine. And I think about kitchen table resistance as a term that I heard, and I just loved it. These, these aunties that are just keeping things in secret. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm tired of wiping my, wiping my snot on my finger. <laughs> Anybody want to shake my hand afterwards? Um, but yeah, I, I just, all these, everyone has horror stories, and it's all just like, oh, you're so resilient, you're so tough to get through this. And it's just so shitty to be, that that's your defining trait. Yeah. And that's what everybody knows is that tragedy. Yeah. Um, and I'm just so tired of being resilient. Mm -hmm. um. or the other thing that always I remembered one day, there was a, a, a gentleman showed up at my house, a non-indigenous man showed up at my house. He was standing at the end of my laneway and he was freaking me out. So I went outside and I said, uh, what the hell are you doing? Can I help you? He said, oh, my grandfather built this house. This is in Hamilton here. So I was excited to meet him. So I wanted to ask him questions about the origins of the house and it's, is the house all unique? Is it what it was? And yes, it was. Like the kitchen, everything's all original. And then he asked me, he said, are you indigenous? He, I said, yes. And you own this home? Yes, good for you. Like, what the hell does that mean? Like, an indigenous person can't own a home? That's what it felt like. And sometimes that's what it feels like um, when your two-spirit and relatives say something similar to you, like, like Tristan and uh, Laura, my relatives, had talked about tonight. You get a lot of that kind of uh, crap. It's like, okay, I'll, I'll still love you if you're, <laughs> if you're queer. My thing has always been, you don't have to love me. I don't care. But you have to respect me. And if you can't respect me, there's no place in my life for you. That's simple. That's how it, it's that simple for me. And I, I try to teach my nieces and nephews that too. You don't have to expect everybody to love you. But if they can't respect you, get rid of them. Any questions out there? I'm looking at the time. Yes. Okay, so um, the English words to spirit um, were a direct translation of the Anishinaabemowin concept of Nishmanadoak, which meant um, two spirits um, of like, and, a, and again, this is not a binary, it's like a spectrum of masculine and feminine energy. And so it exists again on a spectrum and it's continuous and reaches through space and time. And um, so it's very um, so it's very unique to each person, and so each person is going to have their own um, spirit expression. And so it's just this concept that exists. It, it, it really exists in all of us, but in two spirit people, it's pronounced. <laughs> so I guess, does that kind of explain what you were getting at? When I was a kid. When I was like 15 or 16, I was in the car with a relative, and they, that's the first time I heard the, the term two-spirit, and I heard it in the same conversation with, with the term Bradash and a couple other ones of, of, 
and it was really, really condensed. They, it was basically, if you're two-spirit, it means you're a gay Indian. That was what they were concerned, and they really focused on, um, honestly, kind of a, a misogynistic idea of what it meant to be queer, right? It, it meant that you're a little bit of a woman, right? That was, or if you were a two-spirit woman, that means you're a little bit of a man, it is kind of what they were trying to drive home, and it's part of why I didn't really identify as two-spirit as a teenager, and it wasn't until I came down here in the South and met uh, a bunch of a bunch of queer indigenous folk, some of who identified as, as two-spirit and some who didn't, and I realized how umbrella the term is. It, it, you can't nail it down, it's impossible, especially because it's not a, a term that originates in any of our um, language or, or any of our culture. The term two-spirit either comes from uh, Winnipeg or sometimes they say in, in America, and it's only like, what, 20 years old? It, it, it's really just kind of a way to, it's almost a pan-indigenous word. Yeah, exactly. And usually when things are pan-indigenous, I, I shy away from them. But this one felt very right because it was a way of saying, you're indigenous and you're queer, whatever that means, and it's okay. Yeah. Uh, whether that's gender fluidity or, or sexual orientation. And that's a big part of what really brought it for me is because I didn't know. I knew that I was queer and I knew that I was indigenous and I didn't know how those things interacted. And I'm still figuring it out, and that's why I like Two-Spirit, is it gives me a bunch of room where I can just say I'm Two-Spirit, and that's enough. Nobody really needs to know more, and I don't need to have more of an answer than that, because it doesn't matter. It's just kind of this umbrella that, that fits us all and, and has a, enough room for all of us. Uh, so it, it is hard to nail down. It's like when Canada, before Canada became a bilingual country, Indigenous people stood up and said, hey, remember us over here? The original caretakers to the land here? What about us? So then the federal government said, okay, well, choose one indigenous language and we will make it more than a bilingual country. Well, that's ridiculous because we have so many hundreds of different indigenous languages here, we could not do that. So Canada went on to become a bilingual country not acknowledging the indigenous languages here that we have. In 1984, 1985, and the United States and Canada are still fighting, indigenous people in Canada and the United States are still fighting about who coined the term to spirit. It was very much the same thing. Members of the queer community were asking indigenous people, what do you call yourselves? Well, as I had mentioned, in many of our communities, we have identified in some of communities 15 to 17 different genders that help describe who we are as indigenous queer or two-spirit people. So we couldn't just pick one term. So two-spirit became the term that's recognized because what we could all agree upon is that to identify as two-spirit, you have to have this balance and this harmony and accept the fact that you have a masculine being and a feminine being. So that, that's probably the easiest way that I can try to help you understand that. Where, yeah. <laughs> where, where we, we do actually believe that everybody has a masculine and feminine spirit. Okay. We do believe that, right. but some people only identify with a masculine spirit or a feminine spirit, whereas two spirit will identify with both spirits, with both entities. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Thank you so much for your talk, and thank you so much for sharing. It was very moving and really touched us. I was uh, wondering if you could talk a little bit about the staff that you created uh, for your powwow, uh, the, 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 the reason for the staff, and kind of just wanted to get a visual of what that looked like. Do you want to? Yeah, OK. Um, so um, let's see, where do I begin? So Lyndon contacted me first about the staff. He 
<laughs> he was like, Laura, we got to make this stuff. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> so it just so happened, actually, though. Um, so the staff is like a huge um, wooden staff. It's huge. <laughs> it's probably one of the larger ones I've ever seen, actually. <laughs> um, and um, I just automatically, as soon as um, he asked me to help make it, I was like, oh my gosh. Like, I started to cry because um, I had a friend of mine that um, gave me a huge box of eagle feathers. Now, <laughs> these eagle feathers. I was like stunned because she, she got them from a photographer who, a, a, you know, white photographer man who was just out taking pictures in this one area that had an eagle's nest um, very close by. And every time he would go there, there would be all of these feathers dropped on the ground. And so he had been collecting them over the course of years and then met my friend and um, heard about the significance of eagle feathers to indigenous people. He was like, all right, it, can you please see that these feathers get to where they need to go? And so then she shows up at my doorstep one day with this giant box of eagle feathers, and I'm like, ah. <laughs> like, so typical of a two-spirit person. <laughs> like, of course, that's what's going to happen, is they're going to come to my door, and I have to figure out what's going to happen with them. So when Lyndon said, eagle staff time, I'm like, there it is. So um, I attached... Um, so many of these eagle feathers, uh, uh, the rest of them I gave to students because I was working with students at the time too and I gave a bunch away um, to students who were graduating. So the majority of those eagle feathers went on to the staff. And, um, and so I'm not privy to give any teachings about all of that, but um, in addition to the feathers, there is... Uh, I made a rainbow cluster of, of feathers at the very top to kind of, you know, gay throw some, gay it up. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> to gay it up. <laughs> I'm like, how could we not have rainbow feathers? <laughs> so did, we did that. And then um, uh, my memory is failing me and on it, the it, it, it was a very, Yeah, so the very interesting process because different two-spirit people had different things we had been carrying around forever and not mm -hmm. knowing what the purpose was. This was the purpose. Most eagle staffs have one antler on it that I have seen in, along my journey. I had been gifted many years ago that I had been carrying around for probably 30 years, two antlers. And it made sense to me when we started talking about this eagle staff that we were representing masculine and feminine, two-spirit people, and so it had to have two antlers. And then another two-spirit person had all the leather and buckskin that was required and fur that was needed to also kind of queer it up and make it really pretty. It just came together, and Laura is correct. It is the biggest, largest eagle staff I have seen anywhere. It's huge. <laughs> it's massive. It won't even fit in the back of my truck. It's, but it, it's kind of, I feel like this, so eagle staffs are what indigenous communities have always used because flags are not our concept, right? Flags are a foreign construct. Um, we've adopted them now throughout many years. We have come to develop and make our own flags, but our communities had these eagle staffs that would represent the nation or the community or a group of people. For instance, uh, indigenous women have their own eagle staffs. So this eagle staff, I feel like, uh, oh, and then one two-spirit person had the, uh, this enormous staff that was like a piece of driftwood that came up on the water. She picked it up and she'd been carrying that around. So that became the staff. And it just feels like, as in, to me, it felt that walking into the power the first time in Hamilton here with that eagle staff, it's heavy as shit. It's really heavy. <laughs> but it, it also, because we're reclaiming the space, it lets people see we're here. Yeah. Yeah. We've, we're reclaiming our space, and you can tell by our great big fat bastard staff. <laughs> 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 
But it, it's just amazing to, to see how people, when they look at this eagle staff, they've never seen one so large before. And, but it, it really does, when you're a two-spirit person and you know that's the two-spirit ego staff, there's a real strong, heavy sense of pride from yeah. being in its presence because it dominates all other <laughs> staffs. But it's like, it's, it's like a statement. So yes, so the ego staff is representative of the two-spirit people because all indigenous groups, our communities and nations have an ego staff that identify who they are. So we needed to have one on our own. Are there any last? Oh, I think. Yes. Okay. I'm sorry. My stalker, have him removed, please. <laughs> <laughs> he shows up everywhere I am. <laughs> Security. <laughs> Any other questions? We'll give you the last question. Yes, thank you. Is uh, is this too close or is this good? All right. Um, you mentioned uh, some unfortunate circumstances during Pride. Are you, were you referring to Pride Toronto or uh, Pride Hamilton or some other? Uh, uh, that was Pride in Hamilton, 2019. Well, we could also talk about Pride in Toronto, though. Mm -hmm. Yep, I was uh, there both, too. <laughs> both engaged Indigenous people in a very, very poor fashion. Yeah. Uh, well, in the sense that the people coordinating the event did something poorly, or, or more of a public reaction? Well, I think with what happened with so what happened with Hamilton's Pride is that there were just so many things that happened that were really disrespectful for Indigenous people, and I think the first thing that happened was this was a point in time. What year was that, Laura? Twenty nineteen. Twenty nineteen where indigenous people started to fight against pipelines and oil lines. And they had asked a two-spirit person to come and open up um, the, the entire pride. And when the two-spirit person got up there to open up pride, they gave the two-spirit person Nestle bottled water which, of course, we know Nestle, uh, one of our communities close by, has been fighting Nestle and the government for the extraction of their clean water. And then off to the right was TD Bank. And TD Bank is one of the major contributors to pipelines. So that, that started the whole enormous disrespect for indigenous people, but for two-spirit people. And then just the violence that happened um, was, was disrespectful to everybody, not just to spirit people, but it put everybody at a, um, a really compromised, unsafe space. And mm -hmm. my biggest beef about that is, as, as an indigenous queer person, as indigenous people, we're used to trauma. We've seen this kind of violence. We've had it in our face since our existence. Yep. At this pride, there were so many people there who witnessed this violence and nobody has done a damn thing to address their trauma. So we have so many queer relatives and their allies roaming around this city and in other sp spaces who witnessed this trauma but nobody's done anything to reach out to them and say, how can I help you deal with this trauma? That's what really bothers me. And then on top of that, there's also the response of the Hamilton police, who essentially made a statement saying, if you don't want us at Pride, then you don't get our protection either. Uh, and so when yeah. physical violence broke out, they distanced themselves rather yeah, than Yeah, they stood people. by and watched. Yeah. And in Toronto Pride, <laughs> Here's what happened in Toronto Pride. So this is the year, I can't remember the year, but this was a year where there was chaos engaging members, our relatives from the black community. So Black Lives Matter were at Toronto Pride and they shut down Toronto Pride. I don't know what year that was. I can't remember which Right behind them were 
two-spirited people of the First Nation, Ontario Aboriginal HIV AIDS strategy, who had Indigenous youth, young Indigenous people with them. And members who shut down Toronto Pride were coercing the Indigenous youth who, who, youth who had no idea what was going on. Yeah, we had no idea what was going on. And put them in a place of unsafety. They put us to the front. They yeah. demanded us go to the front. They said, two spirits to the front, native to the front, to the front, to the front of what, like, they're, they were stopping the parade, which I agree with, 100%. I agree with stopping the parade. I don't have an issue with what they did. Yep. I have an issue with how they did it, because yes. they did it without talking to us. They did it without our consent, yep. and they did it putting us uh, uh, Operation yeah. Human Shield. Yes. Knowing uh, how police are going to respond, yeah. especially to people of color, especially to queer people of color, uh, like, to put a bunch of indigenous queer youth who don't know what's going on physically and, and, in front and, of them. And, and not, even, not even queer, uh, indigenous queer youth. So from my community, allies, young children under the age of 16 who were allies to indigenous queer were bused there three hours to participate and support queer people in general. They were the ones who were being lured in, and they were the ones who uh, were being asked to stand around members who had stopped the Pride. And quickly, uh, Indigenous adults there realized what was going on, and they ran over and, and first call out, called out the people who stopped Pride and said, this is disrespectful. You put our youth at harm here, mm -hmm. and moved the youth out of there. So with both those prides. But that was also a year that Pride had not consulted with, in Toronto, had not consulted with the Indigenous community. Both were just very problematic. Now, some of that has shifted and changed. Two-Spirit powwow that happened, the first one in Toronto, in part was uh, happened as a result of Pride Toronto um, collaborating with the Indigenous queer, saying, how can we help you? And rather than saying that, okay, well, let's have a big party and get drunk and high and PMP, hey, do you PMP? Um, indigenous response was, that's not part of who we are. We're not about partying and carrying on and all that kind of crap. We're about ceremony and we want a powwow. So Toronto Pride uh, had supported, in part, helped uh, the two-spirit powwow that had happened. It's 9.07 and I know people have places to go. I know everybody's dying to get outside in that humidity. <laughs> I'm just going to uh, say thank you all three, uh, Tristan, Laurie, um, Lyndon, Natasha. Natasha. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, I every speakers of truth. I'm I'm floored at the end of it. I the the courage, the me learning once again that vulnerability has nothing to do with weakness and uh, your open heartedness, your ability to bring such uh, uh, truth to this public forum is nothing short of staggering. So I have such deep respect for everything that you've done here tonight and. Uh, yeah, I just, I have, no, I have no more words. I, thank you all for coming. Let's give them a big <laughs> sign of our appreciation. I did want to point out too that at, when Tor opened up with the land and territorial acknowledgement, it means something to me as an indigenous person to be able to listen to somebody do a territorial acknowledgement and add the whole his all the history that he added on to that acknowledgement without reading it. That means something because in my mind that shows real reconciliation at work in, in somebody who's made a commitment to making reconciliation a priority. So chimigwetch for that. Thanks. Good job on the language too. Yeah. I, I wish I could tell you the, the terror that I feel every time I do it in this context. Absolutely well. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Thank you, everyone who's, who's with us online. Uh, please come to the next Speakers of Truth. Thank you. Yeah. I just got like so many messages from people who watch online and said the three of us were awesome. <laughs>
Uh, you guys are fucking awesome. <laughs> so sweaty. Uh-huh. <laughs> oh. A little bit hungover, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. 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 Oh.